Hello there, my name is Jordan Reginald Alec, and I've been volunteering at the Canada Comics Open Library as a librarian, comics consultant, and board member for uh, about as long as it's been around for. Nearly its inception is when I got invited to join this, this wonderful library that has been existing for a couple of years now. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for joining us for another online Comics Out Loud event. Uh, just going to say a few words and then hand it over to our storytellers for the evening. Uh, there will be time at the end for questions and answers, so feel free to ask what's on your mind in the Q&A box on the Zoom screen, which the cartoonist may answer at the end of all of the readings. Tonight's readings are being recorded and will be posted to YouTube in the near future. This project would not have been possible without the support of the Ontario Arts Council, uh, thanks to an arts grant. We are hoping this project can be a resource to blind and visually impaired community members who often aren't able to access the comics medium. On this note, I would like to take a quick moment to describe what is currently being shown on screen. A white person with, brown, with a brown beard and yellow sweatshirt sits in front of a colorful painting with a small space heater to their left and a pile of fabric atop a little closed cabinet to their right. For those who haven't heard about our organization, the Canada Comics Open Library was founded in 2018. We are a volunteer run library and nonprofit organization focused on comics, their accessibility and showcasing how incredible comics can be. You can visit our website at canadacomicsol.org to view our projects, blog and other online comics resources. The Canada Comics Open Library would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional Anishinaabe Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and that Indigenous peoples have lived on and cared for this land for more than 15,000 years. This territory is covered by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Belt Treaty. Today, Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge that settlers on the land directly benefit from the process of colonization. Settlers like myself and Canadian organizations have a lot of work to do. With no exception to our library, Canada Comics Open Library is currently focusing on prioritizing Indigenous comics for our collection, showcasing Indigenous creators on our website and physical library space, making our cataloging system more inclusive of Indigenous communities through tagging and language, and making our space accessible to Indigenous creators. Please get in touch with us if you have any suggestions towards furthering these goals. Thank you all for attending our online event and for everyone viewing it on YouTube post live online event. Um, as the continuing COVID-19 pandemic persists to not allow us from hosting this Read Out Loud event in our physical library space, we appreciate you tuning in. Okay, now on to the comics. I will uh, once again say, please ask any questions in the question and answer box on your screen. Um, the cartoonist won't answer them right away. That will be for the, the end of all of the storytelling, um, but I'll pass it along to our first cartoonist, which is a collaboration between Kamiko and Keith. So I'll hand it off to you guys. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jordan. Thanks to Canada Comics Library for having us. We're super excited to be here and um, to get to do a reading for both of you, um, uh, for both for all of you. <laughs> both of us. Um, just uh, background first. Uh, so um, I'm Kimiko, and um, I am sitting in front of a white wall um wearing a blue button up um uh, mixed race um japanese canadian short hair butch presenting um hi i'm keith i am the illustrator of oh, can we go this can't, can't say. i am a bad person wearing headphones and a floral print shirt in the bedroom <laughs> which is purple with I can see my bed and behind it there's like a floral print duvet and a wall hanging of Frida Kahlo. <laughs> so, so Keith and I worked together. Um, I wrote a uh, memoir about my experience getting breast cancer uh, six years ago um, when I was 25. 
And um, it was through the process of kind of um, sorting through what had happened and starting to doodle on my own uh, through those experiences um, and realizing that there wasn't a whole lot out there um, from kind of a young perspective, queer perspective, um, that uh, I started to think, okay, well, maybe there's there's kind of greater need for uh, more stories. And um, so started asking around, looking for potential illustrators to take my stick figures to the next level. Um, <laughs> that makes sense. And uh, that's, that's how I uh, got Keith's name and um, how we kind of got started on this process. Uh, so okay. uh, just our, our, I'll just say our, our book came out, Kimi Goda's Cancer came out in October, 2020 um, through our Arsenal Pulp Press in Vancouver. I thought it was going to be a scene, um, <laughs> but it's not. It's a whole book. <laughs> Today we're going to read an excerpt from a couple of chapters. Um, we're going to read an excerpt and then we'll take questions. If there are no questions, we will talk about the process. Um, should we start now? Yeah, yeah, so we'll do um, the questions uh, kind of at the end as Jordan flagged uh, after we hear from Nadia as well, um, but you can always throw them in the, the chat box uh, so you don't forget them if you have any. Um, and also, uh, as Jordan mentioned, we'll be doing um, our best uh, to provide uh, descriptions of the illustrations. Um, so that uh, it's kind of more accessible to folks who might be low vision. All right, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, and uh, this, it, it, don't worry if you can't read kind of the, the text on the pages here, if it's small on your screen. Um, of course, we'll be, be reading all the dialogue and the captions and, and um, but we wanted to, we set this up so that you can kind of see the page all, all at once um, if you're uh, able to, to do so. So just in terms of background on illustration style. So aside from the cover, all the pages are in black, white and gray blue. The style of the illustrations are semi-realistic but with occasional anime style exaggerations. So, you know, think giant beads of sweat. Um, I'm going to be reading the captions and my own dialogue. And then Keat will be reading all other dialogue and um, we'll also be splitting back and forth in terms of the descriptions. And we'll do our best to kind of flag if we're switching kind of from caption to, to dialogue. So we're starting here at the prologue at the beginning of the book. Um, prologue. The entire pro prologue chapter is with the back Black background conveying a somber mood. So there are three panels. The first takes up the top half of the page and shows Kimiko sitting on her bed in her pajamas, talking on the phone. The second panel is a close up of Kimiko, and the third pans out slightly and shows Kimiko at the base of a set of stairs. All the text on the page is dialogue between Kimiko and the person on the phone. Dialogue. One sec. I just noticed some sort of lump on my chest. Where is it? I don't know. Above my breast? Does it hurt? No. Just to be safe, I'm going to go upstairs to show my mom. Keep it posted, okay? I'll call you back. Love you. Bye. Caption. 
Oh, sorry, first uh, in terms of description. So again, we're, we're black background. Um, there are four panels, no dialogue, um, all captions. And what we see is Kimiko walking upstairs through the house. So in the first panel, there is a, um, from the point of view of someone looking upstairs at a closed door. Um, the second and third panel, almost make up a, a single panel, but they're split with a, a break partway through. The panel uh, shows the, um, th those two panels show the opening of a door and um, with my hand on the door handle. And then the last panel that runs the width of the page at the bottom, you can see a close up of a, a ledge with plants. Caption. My mind immediately went there. Cancer. I'd seen enough ads about self-exams. I told myself that I was overreacting. I was 25. It was far more likely to be something benign. But what if it really was cancer? The next page is continuing to follow Kimiko through her house. Panel showing first, a close-up of young photos of Kimiko. Second, a close-up of Kimiko's feet walking up the stairs. Third, bare trees are visible through a window. And fourth, Kimiko is seen paused in front of a front one, in front of a closed door, hand on the handle. Caption. I wondered what I'd look like without boobs, without hair. Would I keep working? What if I had to tell people I was dying? What would people say at my funeral? So that's the end of the prologue. Um, what follows are uh, two chapters, one that looks at my diagnosis and some of the active treatments. So going through a lumpectomy, um, getting fertility treatments to preserve my eggs, and um, then radiation and going on medications to put me in induced menopause for uh, several years um, that I'm, I'm still on. The chapter that we're gonna pick up on uh, is the third chapter. Um, so it follows the prologue, the diagnosis chapter, and there's also um, another chapter that looks at my relationship to the cancer community. So we're, we're picking up here. Um, on the chapter called The Impact. The chapter title page has a white background and shows a panel in the center of the page with Kimiko topless in boxers looking in a mirror um, with a blank expression. And uh, there's a visible scar above uh, one of her breasts. So on this page, there are three panels on the white background. The first panel is on the left, is on the left of the page, and is reminiscent of the chapter title page, showing Kimiko topless in boxers in front of, in front of a mirror, this time in air bathroom. The two panels on the right are one on top of the other. Both show Kimiko sit, seated in bed with her girlfriend. Caption, I don't have cancer anymore, but the surgery and my cancer preventing medications mean there are differences in how my body looks and feels. A scar, induced menopause, fatigue, dialogue. I am, could you massage my scar? My physio says I should, but I feel too squeamish to do it myself. Caption, menopause meant a low libido which created a new dy dynamic with my partner. I mostly stopped initiating sex. Dialogue. Sorry, I'm not in the mood right now. The next page is um, on a white background. There are four panels of equal size. And all four panels show Kimiko seated at a desk beside a male figure. 
Both are in business attire and Kimiko has a laptop in front of her. In the first panel, Kimiko is shown with a flushed face. She gets increasingly flushed and sweaty as the panels progress. Caption, hot flashes are also an unwelcome addition to my professional life. My age, race, gender, and gender presentation already undercut my presumed competence as a lawyer. Looking like a sweaty mess doesn't exactly help matters. She looks like a 12-year-old boy. Thought bubble. Oh no, this blazer is triggering a hot flash. Thought bubble. Oh great. It looks like she doesn't even trust her own device. Thought bubble. I better end this now. Dialogue. So let me know if you want me to file that lawsuit for you. Um, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> so the next page is a black background with six equal size panels showing Kimiko in bed, tossing and turning. There is a clock at the bottom right of the panels. Kimiko's phone is beside her. We'll describe each panel separately. So in the first panel, um, oh, sorry, first I'll read the, the caption there. So caption, insomnia and hot flashes make bedtime treacherous. 11 o'clock p.m. Description, Kimiko is lying in bed <laughs> under her blankets. Phone is visible beside her. 11.15 p.m. Description, Kimiko's eyes are open. She looks worried and awake. Her phone is now closer on her pillow. 12.30 a.m. Kimiko is wide awake looking at her phone. There is a bubble above her head with a heart in it. Her phone shows an image and description of a dog named Haru from an adoption website. 12.45 a.m. Kimiko is lying on her stomach with a furrowed brow, eyes closed, blankets off. 1.45 a.m. Kimiko's eyes are open and she has bags under her eyes and a very worried look on her face. She is lying on her back and her phone is playing a meditation. Start your meditation with a deep inhale. 2.30 a.m. Kimiko is lying on her back again, blankets off, furrowed brow. The next page is on a white background with two panels running the width of the page. The second panel is bigger than the first and both show Kimiko lying in bed with her girlfriend. In the first panel, they're close together and in the second, they're separated with only their pinkies touching. Caption, cuddling is now a time limited affair, which depending on the moment can be sad, awkward, disappointed or annoying. Dialogue, I had a really rough day. Can you just hold me? Sure thing. Hot flash! Don't worry, babe. BRB, I promise. So on the next page, four panels against the white background. Each panel shows a different scene because and because each are different and there's so many, we'll describe each separately alongside the text. First panel is the scene of Kimiko at night standing inside a building looking at the snow falling outside. Caption, I'm constantly weighing my options. Thought bubble, which would be worse right now? A hot flash or a chill? Second panel, Kimiko is seated in front of a computer showing a dapper fashion website with a model wearing a three-piece suit and tie. Thought bubble. <sighs> I could never wear that many items at once. Third panel, Kimiko has large beads of sweat covering her body. She's wearing a t-shirt walking through a crowded market. Caption, traveling to hot climates is a problem. Thought bubble, wait, is it gonna feel like this the whole time? 
fourth panel, fourth panel. Close up of travel items and arrows pointing to the items. Caption. Traveling in general also requires more planning. Compression sleeves, medical records, and pills, pills, pills. Caption. Planning my life to minimize the chance of a hot flash is exhausting. I hate how they intrude on my life. Not only are they uncomfortable, but they also remind me that I had cancer. On the next page, there is a white background and three equal sized panels, each the width of the page. The first panel shows Kimiko in a hot shower. The second shows Kimiko eating a brownie out of a tray with freshly whipped cream. The third shows Kimiko through a house window stretching. Caption, because I'm so often uncomfortable, I try to cherish those few moments I'm not. The brief moment in a shower when the heat soaks into my bones before it triggers a hot flash. The sensory comfort of eating, something that is, that is even more important now. The few hours after waking up from a good night's sleep before I get tired again. The next page is four panels against the white background. The first is the width and a half, a half the height of the page. It shows Kimiko sitting on a stool, spraying her plants with water and talking on the phone. The next two panels show Kimiko waving goodbye to two people drinking and talking. The last panel shows Kimiko outside on the street looking sad. You can see into the house window showing people animated inside. Caption. Everything combined means I need more downtime to be healthy. Dialogue. Sorry, I'm gonna stay home and putter today. Caption. I know making time for myself is healthy, not to mention disruptive of big city expectations, but it doesn't stop the fear of missing out. Dialogue. I'm gonna head out. What? It's Friday. Live a little, dude. Thought bubble. I wish drinking didn't bring on hot flashes and I didn't get so tired. Dialogue. Bye, Kimiko. Right, what was I saying? Caption. Not that I was ever much of a partier, but now it feels more out of my control. The next page is a white background with a full spread of six, showing six doors. Each door has a caption on top of it in a white square. Kimiko is looking through one of the bottom doors. Caption, searching for the perfect drugs to minimize symptoms is a constant struggle. Door one, fewer hot flashes, but gassiness. Door two, solid sleep for a few hours, but a really bad taste in my mouth the entire next day. Door three, less intense hot flashes, but still unbearable, plus no grapefruit juice. Door four, new drug, but hard to say if it's any better than the old drug. Dialogue, hmm, which door should I pick? Caption, or door, door five, fewer side effects, but estrogen content of the drug creates risk of recurrence. Door six, fewer hot flashes, but only for the first 10 days. The next page um, has <laughs> six panels um, depicting two different scenes. The top panel is the width of the page and shows Kimiko seated in front of her doctor in conversation. The next five panels are Kimiko meeting with a different doctor. This time, she is in a hospital gown and is showing her doctor her breath. She looks nervous and awkward. Caption. My doctors and I sometimes disagree about how to prove my quality of life. Dialogue. I was reading this study that said medical marijuana could... I don't care what Trudeau says. Marijuana is dangerous. Caption. At the plastic surgeons. 
We can detach the scar tissue from our chest muscle and add fat to prevent re-adhesion and plump up, plump up the breast. I can see your right breast is now a half a cup size smaller than your left breast. It is? Yep. While I'm there, shall I plump up your left breast? That's not the one. Well, some patients figure might as well do both at the same time. Thanks, but I'll skip the bigger breasts. The last two pages of the chapter are thematically similar and show a continued sequence. There is a black background and a somber mood for both pages. Kimiko is seen looking into a mirror and her expression swaps between nervous, angry, and sad. Caption, even before cancer, mystery ailments could make my mind wander to worst case scenarios. The difference now is that they don't seem so improbable. Thought bubble. That lump wasn't there before. What if my cancer metastasized? Metastasis refers to the cancer having spread to another area of the body. Calm down. There's no way that could happen. Well, that's what I thought the first time too, but here we are. It'll be worse this time. Chemo for sure. I'll have to quit my job, move back home. So much for getting my life on track. Have you forgotten you're in menopause? The doctors cut off what fed the cancer. Well, maybe it's a new cancer. Maybe I'm prone to cancer. Sure, now you're just being ridiculous. Maybe it's better this way. I won't have to live with the fear of when it might come back. Okay, so, so we're ending on a bit of a heavy note. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, yeah, those are the excerpts that we wanted to read for you. And um, we're, we're looking forward to hearing Nadia and, and happy to answer any questions or just kind of chat about process and our collaboration at the end. Well, geez, thank you so much, Kamiko and Keith, that was, that was a great story to listen to. And I want to get my hands on that book now and read the rest <laughs> of it. Living in a body is a strange thing. And the, the, the way that you're able to tell your story um, through, through the hardships is something that we all should think about. Because like you were saying, like in at the very end there, just because it's gone, there's still all of this worry. And I think, at least I know I, I'm always worrying about health stuff. And I don't know, I'm, I'm yammering on. And it, that was just a great story. Thank you for sharing it, guys. Thanks so much. Um, we'll get back to you two in a little bit after we uh, hear from Nadia. So Nadia, I'll let you take the reins here. Hi there. Uh... Thank you, Kimiko and Keith, for sharing. That was really fantastic. And thanks for everybody who's attending right now. Uh, my name is Nadia Shames. I'm OK if you call me Nadia. Um, I am a pale, young Middle Eastern woman. Uh, I am wearing a long sleeved black shirt that also has a gray kufiya pattern on it. I am also wearing headphones with cat ears on. Uh, and in my background, I have some unfortunately messy bookshelves that have a lot of books, scenes, DVDs, and also a traditional kufiya in the background. Um, so let me get started on. this. Okie doke. Um, so I am presenting a short scene that I did or the first half of a short scene that I did that was originally a short story drawn by Natasha Alterici, who's also known for the comic series Heathen for a charity anthology called The Good Fight. Um, and after I originally did this piece and it was very personal, I kept coming back to kind of the idea of the specific legacy that Palestinians can often feel, um, especially as 
you know, your stories and as cultural heritage, as preservation and some of the pressure of that. So I wanted to talk to other uh, Palestinian creators of the North American diaspora about their feelings. So the second half of the zine, which you, I won't, you won't see here, but you can find it for free on my website, is um, interviewing various Palestinian American creators to ask about their family history, their relationship to Palestinian identity, and how that intersects with their work. But without further ado, um, this is no olive branch for me. Um, the story is by me, the art by Natasha Alterici, and this fantastic cover design is by Aya Kirscht. The cover has dark text reading the title of the work, no olive branch for me, with the last names of the creators on the bottom. Behind the text is a kafia pattern with olive leaves against a white background. Also, um, for those who don't know what the kafia is, it is a traditional pattern that is often found on Middle Eastern scarves that has become synonymous with the movement for Palestinian liberation. Um, so I wanted to say that I have on one side the pages and on the other side um, written down my notes in case there is anyone who is watching who is also uh, struggles with um, auditory issues or just simply can't understand me. Um, and also, uh, I've made slight changes because I realized that when transferring this to, you know, a more spoken medium that maybe sometimes the caption was were a little awkward, but nonetheless. Um, so this comic was done in muted tones and variations of green, red, white, and black, as the artist's intention was to utilize a color palette based on the Palestinian flag. This page specifically is primarily composed of olive green and yellow tones. Um, my mother, Vida, grew up in Bethlehem. And in the first panel, we can see a young woman walking down the main street of the city, waving at a neighbor. My mother was raised on a farm that we kept in the family for generations. She later moved to the city, but the farm was always a big part of our lives. Um, in this panel, there are large olive trees drawn primarily in a painterly impressionistic way with trailing shadows. Olive harvesting was a momentous occasion in Palestine. Several adults and children will often hold ladders to the tree for one person to climb up and harvest, and the rest of the people on the ground sort through the olives and the branches, which we can see in this panel. In the next panel, the sky darkens a little bit more red, and we can see a bulldozer next to a large tree stump going towards a tree that has not yet been knocked down. And eventually the land that my family held was encroached on and a portion of it was lost. Up close, we can see in the next panel broken olive branches in the grass. Some of the trees were lost and the metaphor of the discarded olive branches is almost too obvious to say. My mother, Vida, in this panel stands in the center of crowd of Palestinian protesters, all waving their arms, waving Palestinian flags and wearing kafiyas. Um, we also see a man with a blowhorn. She wears a green shirt and has her black wavy hair pulled away from her face in a ponytail. She was a frequent protester in college and has many stories. It's hard to believe sometimes the things she's seen and risked. And some of the things she's seen as shown in this panel is a soldier in riot gear knocking back a young man to the ground violently. She turns in the next panel to see what's happened and begins to run. On her face is an expression of fear and anger. Despite the risk, she and so many others understood at that time that silence was death. But when my grandfather lost his store, the family had to weigh their options. In this panel, my mother bows her head in front of my grandmother, holding the kafia that was once on her neck in her own hands. My mother is lecturing her on danger and the increasing difficulty of their life in Palestine. In the far background, my mother's sisters listen. In the next panel, a baby, the next generation, is swathed in a kafia as a baby blanket. And the caption reads, isn't survival a kind of resistance of its own? 
The fresh start wasn't what they got, though. When you're Palestinian in America, the very nature of your existence is an invitation for people to politicize you. And in this panel, takes place several years after my family leaves Palestine. We can see my mother with her dark hair styled in a half updo with a green sweater and khaki pants. My hair as a little girl on this panel is styled in a similar way. I'm clicking to her leg wearing an orange sweater while my mother shops in the store looking at some purses. In the background, a woman with red hair and a green cardigan watches us. While my family was proud of their heritage, they came here with the hope of a new life and integration, especially for me. The thing about being othered, though, is that it's not up to you when it happens. The red-haired woman strikes up a conversation with us in this panel, saying, you have such a lovely accent. Where are you from? My mother replies, oh, Palestine. The woman in the next panel looks perturbed by the answer, starting to speak on the conflict. She says, why don't Palestinians want peace? They're always making trouble on the news. My mother, having learned how to keep her poker face on, tries to interject by saying, well, the red haired woman continues with, well, honestly, I don't think anyone should have the land since they can't get along. Panel five, and even at a young age, I wanted to defend my family, my heritage, and I wanted to defend us. It took me years to learn to conserve energy, to pick to my battles. In this final panel on the page, my childhood self is frowning at the red haired woman crossing my arms and I'm obviously annoyed. My mother puts a hand on my head and another on my shoulder, comforting me. The family mantra became, not everyone needs to know where we're from. My mother explains this to me as we leave the store and walk through the parking lot. When asked, the various women in my family all have different answers prepared. My grandmother, an older woman with a short pixie cut and glasses, often says, I do not speak English, I do not understand, when someone pushes her on their background. My mother, older now and wearing glasses herself, often simply says she's from Egypt as she lived there for a portion of her 20s. And me seeing what my family says, I often just say, I'm from Brooklyn. Um, at this point, I'm an adult in the story and I wear a burgundy sweater, have long, dark, wavy hair and big chunky glasses. Um, it kept me protected, my answers, but it made me angry. Wasn't my legacy of protests of being loud. The truth is I can't win here. I'm made political by merit of my existence. No matter what I see, including pro IDF demonstrations on my college campus or the harassments of Students of Justice for Palestine members. If I'm angry, they'll call me savage or irrational. A newscaster shows a picture of Palestinian men screaming in protest. The next panel, boycott, divestments, and sanctions, a peaceful boycott movement against goods illegally made in occupied territories is often legislated against. We see Andrew Cuomo speaking in front of an American flag, making a speech against BDS. When you do try to explain, you're wound up tight, defensive. You have to be pleasant to be heard. But the truth is there's nothing pleasant to say. And so I often feel silenced. This panel is an image of that same kufiya stuffed in my mouth. Every new interaction made me weigh whether I felt up to the labor of explaining myself or taking on their feelings. I, in the comic, am approached by a woman in a white cardigan with bob length dark hair. Next panel, the woman asks where I'm from. I say, Brooklyn. The woman pushes further saying, no, I mean, where are you really from? Your background. I look away, already feeling where the conversation is going to go. I feel trapped in a situation I never agreed to, not being able to say the things I want to say. The woman, appearing very empathetic, says, I feel so bad for Palestinians, but Tel Aviv was so beautiful, you know. I'm making a face of displeasure, rolling my eyes in the panel. Very, are you serious? I respond, so I heard it's very hard for Palestinians to visit. The woman bulldozes past what I'm saying, responding with, oh, you have to go. You won't believe the gorgeous buildings. Next panel, I feel a lot of pressure to do something. I have a lot of guilt about shrinking away. In the crowd of people in this panel, my figure shrinks into just a red silhouette far away from everyone else. 
next panel, I know the difference between keeping quiet and peaceful discussion. I know there's no metaphorical olive branch for me. So what does resistance look like a world away? Myself in the comic finds herself under a large olive tree, considering the legacy she's part of and what we've already lost. I imagine I'm not the only Palestinian American who hasn't quite figured out how to navigate their negative representation, but I've come to realize my biggest form of resistance is to simply be visible. In this panels, I am getting dressed for the day and digging for my kufiyeh. In panel three, the media shows angry Palestinians are dying Palestinians that no one can imagine anything else. And the images in the wreckage of a protest, we can see injured and tired Palestinians marching on despite everything. To thrive, to be publicly Palestinian, and to force others to confront my humanity is resistance. Survival, after all, is resistance. As my comic self gets ready for the day, she reaches into her drawer for the kafia, ready not to be gagged by it now, but to wear it proudly and beautifully. In the fifth panel, a uh, young woman with red hair and a black and white top asks me, what's your background? And we are in a bookstore. In the last panel, I say, I won't hesitate. I'm Palestinian. I'll say it to the whole world. And in my comic self, I have my kafia on and a smile on my face. And as I said at the beginning, the second part of the scene on my website and also in print includes interviews with sick Palestinian creators of the diaspora about how their identity intersects with their work and to what extent they feel responsible to speak up on identity. These creators work uh, across various fields, including film, game design, poetry, and comics. You can find it on NadiaShamas.com under the comics tab. It has its own section and it's free to look at. And thank you. That is my presentation. Thank, thank you so much for sharing that. That was so good. We'll, we'll just open it up to the questions here because we did get a few questions for you all. So I'll ask Kamiko and keep to uh, hop back on this chat as well because uh, it looks like all three of these questions are capable to be answered by, by anyone. So the first one is, uh, why did you choose comics to tell your particular stories um, over prose, et cetera? Uh, did your final narrative shift you from how you had originally conceived them? Um, yeah, I guess, so uh, for myself, um, it's kind of funny. The original reason is that I thought comics would allow me to emotionally hide more. <laughs> um, Keith helped, you know, teach me that's not the case. Um, but uh, when I was originally imagining what this would be, I thought of it more as kind of witty, short um, anecdotes about, you know, some of my interactions with my doctors. Um, and so, uh, it was only through working with Keith that um, she helped me expand the story and um, add more of uh, the emotional nuance that, that comes into it. Um, but it was really naivete that uh, <laughs> had me choosing um, comics as the form originally. She thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, How about you, Nadia? Did you originally have the idea for the story in comic form? I think that I had always kind of, uh, you know, I, the first comics I did were memoir -y, so I guess I, I felt more familiar. And I have always wanted to do more work about, you know, kind of thoughts around my identity. I know that's not so original, but whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, so then when the um, anthology presented itself, I was like, oh, perfect. And I got to work with a creator who I really, really loved and respected, and I could not pass that up. Um, I think that for me, something that helps with comics is that it's, you know, when someone's reading No Olive Branch for me, they have to contend with by face, you know, with human faces like to some of the things that they have read about. And I think that it's it's a little bit harder to discredit, I guess, marginalized folks when you have to 
look at them. Um, and also it just allows for some really beautiful visuals and tone and, you know, um, some really kind of metaphorical images. So that's kind of why I, I think sometimes I find that comics are a little bit easier to do memoirs with because you don't have to, you can, you have another language in which to explain yourself now. You know, it's not just words. You can, you know, I, I think um, my first, my first ever comics thing was an anthology called Corpus, which was about um, healthcare and disability. Um, and I found that it was just easier to show people sometimes because everyone experiences it differently. And so from then on, I was like, comic memoir is superior. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, coming from an ignorance that I have on my own, I didn't know what a kafia was or the kafia pattern. Um, was exactly and and if I were to just read that word over and over again I wouldn't be able to visualize it and the way that you use that pattern as a symbol throughout the story was very yeah, very I fit the comic medium nicely. I was very lucky to work with some really exceptional co-creators so yeah. <laughs> Cool. Well, um, here's another question since we're on the note of co-creators and such. Um, do you have any tips for creators collaborating on personal projects? Tips for collaborations on these projects. <laughs> um, Kimiko and I have a whole, whole spiel about this, like, <laughs> yeah, this <laughs> whole thing. But like, you know, collaborating. Um, make your expectations clear and mostly have a contract which is like one of our favorite tips but like mostly like you know communicating openly of course because like you know in the collaboration and you think it like you know like even like boundaries and capacities um can you know, get tired or like we can you know you, you maybe the work is going to go in the same direction but it really helps to communicate openly all the time so yeah, that's one of the things. Yeah, for sure. I think um, you know, Keith just alluded to it, but in terms of an agreement, um, we found it really helpful the fact that at the beginning we actually put it down in writing. You know, what were the terms? You know, what's how's money? How's page rate going to work? What's going to happen if um, page edits happen? You know, how many before there's additional page rate owing? Uh, timing, you know, character design rights, um, you know, there's a lot of things um, at the beginning, which, we, you know, who knows where it was going to go, we weren't sure if it was going to be published or, or what, but um, we found it really helpful to kind of have those discussions, even if sort of awkward at the beginning, um, but to, to kind of create that trust um, between the two of us and, um, you know, understanding about, okay, you know, if things break down partway through, what's going to happen and, and to have that clarity. Um, you know, fortunately for us, it didn't happen. But I, I think probably having those conversations helped, um, you know, reduce the likelihood of that, that as well. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, yeah, I think communication is definitely the most important thing. I think the contract is a great great piece of advice because you know um making comics is very labor intensive and i think that you know you make great points about like things change it's a relationship it's a collaborative relationship there it, there there needs to be a lot of mutual respect and open communication and even if you are friends you are working on a professional thing together and you know you need to make it so that even if you know you're going through stuff friendships change whatever you know you you're on the same page at least towards the project and um i definitely think that you know, new creators can sometimes want to be like, oh, I know this name. I want to work with this person. And that's not the way to go. I think you got to cultivate, you know, people around you that you have kind of similar working styles, similar, you know, interests visually or references, you know, just similar vibes, I guess, <laughs> and uh, try to, to make it work, you know, like, yeah. And um, I'm, I'm a comic writer, primarily. I have not shown anyone my art yet. 
But if you're a writer, I think an important thing for you to know is that, you know, you are not the boss of your artist. You have to let them, you know, make, you have to let them, you know, interpret your work visually they know what they're doing more than you visually you know they're not like just a tool to you know get your script onto art it's just that's not how it is so you have to you know provide you know as much support as possible and know when to like not be precious because when you're collaborating you can't be precious yeah, that really, yeah, that really happened between, like, with us, <laughs> yeah. like both, both, both sides. Like, no, listen, I, <laughs> I am not speaking from just like you know, just like mystical knowledge really? that's come down on me. I have been, uh, you know, I've learned through being a bad collaborator how to improve. So, <laughs> I want everyone to skip that part and just go to being good at it. You know. <laughs> yeah those are important things to keep in mind the whole idea of getting a contract even if you're working with friends it, it can be so awkward to start talking in that kind of manner but if you're trying to take things seriously it's the best way to go really so yeah. those are yeah. those are great words you guys are saying what that's that's awesome stuff um there's one more question here so uh, what were some of the challenges or was there anything unexpected that came up when adapting your comic to be read out loud? It's such an intimate way of sharing your work. It's so powerful and affecting hearing these stories being read out loud. Yeah, so what were some of the challenges of adapting to reading these, these visual stories um, out loud? Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know challenges, I, I think, um, at least for myself, I, uh, I, it was fun to kind of engage with the work in a different way. Um, and even this is I th the first time that we've um, really done the uh, audio descriptions as well. And that was fun to kind of think about, okay, how do we want people to experience this? Um, and so, you know, there's the example of that, the page with, um, you know, I'm tossing and turning in bed. And there, there were, you know, there's captions, but there's not a lot of text there. Mostly it's just the, the clock. And um, really what's important there is, you know, seeing how I'm moving about. Um, and so, you know, when did we want to read a caption? When did we want to offer the description? When do we want to say the time? And so just kind of thinking through that uh, was, was sort of fun to think, okay, you know, um, yeah, how do we pull up people to receive this? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I guess um, I, I'd never, you know, uh, try to um, translate my comics in this way. And I think that it was really interesting and eye-opening to kind of relook at the pages and kind of think about how to, I guess, get the energy out of the comic into an audio form. Um, and... Uh, and yeah, I think it, it makes you look at your own work in a different way, um, which is which is always nice to reconsider and also to just, uh, you know, we could all do with being more conscious of how to make our work more accessible. So um, it was nice. It, it was honestly a nice experience. Neat. It's, it's kind of a funny full circle because since two of you are comic writers, rather than comic drawers you at least one point had to use words to describe a panel I would imagine and then you get the panel and then you're describing what's on the panel yeah it's not and it's not the same it's not the same as like <laughs> writing out the script to be translated to work and then like po doing it in post I guess to uh, make it to to make it to audio it's not the same thing at all it's like a whole other skill um, and I looked at, I looked at other references of how other people have done it before I did this. And, you know, I think that, uh, uh I'm starting to ramble. Okay. That's okay. No. <laughs> I'm cut myself off now. <laughs> um, one, one more question did appear, unless, uh, you have anything to add to that, Keith. 
Um, no. <laughs> I'm like, literally, what is it? But, like, but like, I like, but I will say, though, that while it is a challenge to do kind of, like, descriptions for comics, um, it's so important to do that. Um, especially, like, in, you know, like, if we were talking about access, you know, like, Kimiko and I were talking yesterday about how there's just, like, so many ways to, 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 like, basically open up access to creative work, and we're still, like, getting on, let's put the iceberg regarding those things, so, yeah, I think that it's great that Canada, Canada, oh, maybe it's open library, <laughs> that kind of, like, <laughs> made it a requirement to at least start on, like, descriptions, because that really helps. <laughs> yeah, that's you it listen to um and i'm sure some other folks will have had the opportunity as well but listen to um the workshop adapting comics to uh yeah. Vision and yeah um blind uh readers and it was really fascinating i think one of the main things that um i took away from it was that you know m what we should try and be working towards is this idea of putting enough metadata into um, an audiobook of a comic that allows the reader to choose what they want. So, you know, here we are making artistic decisions um, in, in what we're describing. So, you know, we just, you know, okay, I didn't go into the, the fashion choices, but Keats fashion in this book should be <laughs> its own thing altogether. It's amazing. Um, and so, you know, potentially that's something a reader's choosing. Okay, I want to hear about the outfits that people are wearing, but another reader won't care about that and, and they might find it distracting and they really just want to hear the high level. Um, so, you know, I'm not visually impaired, so not that I want to in any way be directing this conversation, but that seems to me um, a good direction to be going to, to meet both a variety of needs and preferences because it shouldn't just be about what people need. This is an art form. And so people should also be able to play a role in, in um, you know, directing that. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's amazing to, to listen to your input on there. Um, I should mention quickly that there is some auto-generated text appearing at the bottom of the screen right now. Some of that might uh, have been mistyped because it is just a robot um, typing this out. We will go through it. Uh, after it's all done and correct any of those uh, errors when we publish it online. Just thought I'd put that as an aside since we're talking about accessibility right now. Um, there's one more question here. Uh, are you working on new projects right now? And where is the best place to purchase these books and other work you have? <laughs> you wanna start? Um, yes, I am working on a new issue of my personal team right now. Um, which will be out hopefully in May, but you know, already I am feeling the burn of procrastination. <laughs> um, but yeah, I also have an Etsy shop at Makeship Love, and you can buy our book at um, the Arsenal Pulp website or actually any bookstore. <laughs> so, I think, yeah, like I know for sure it's on Indigo and Amazon. But like, of course, it's also my, you know, like, and elsewhere. So, um, the beguiling. <laughs> yeah, check, your, check your local shops first. Um, it, it should be at uh, at most places. How about you, Kimiko? What are your questions? Um, I guess well, one thing that Keith and I both worked on together was a greeting card line. <laughs> so we're both stationary nerds. Um, yes. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this through the comic book helped explore my own creativity, uh, which is in its infancy. Um, also, like Nadia, no one has seen my <laughs> my artwork. If I can <laughs> <that>. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, we, we kind of uh, worked on a on a greeting card line that has. Um, is we're calling the tough times greeting cards and the idea is for folks who are going through something difficult what's a more kind of authentic um way that you, you know expression of supporting them that's not just you know my condolences or my sympathies uh so 
you know, we, we've got an example of, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry you're going through this and then I wish I had the right words. And then on the inside is a checklist of kind of, you know, it's, uh, but I don't. So here's a list of things I can do instead. Uh, you know, so, it's so nice. or, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, watching TV together, or, or I mean, it looks a little different during COVID, but um, yeah, anyway, so that was kind of a, a fun and, and project to work on and Keith did amazing um, patterns and uh, illustrations for that. Uh, so, um, and that's kind of uh, veered off into a couple other card um, lines. Un, Where can we buy those cards? <laughs> right. So that's through Kimiko and Co. is the the name, and that we're uh, also on Etsy and um, and on Instagram. Um, I cool. just want to say, if I received any of those cards, I would probably just weep. <laughs> and also, I now want to send those cards to everyone I know <laughs> in the year twenty twenty. <laughs> oh my god, wait, it's 2021. <laughs> Never mind. What, <laughs> what, is, what is time? <laughs> we can edit that out. <laughs> yeah. There yeah. are no edits. <laughs> yeah, there's also a, a queer COVID line that I worked with a different uh, artist on. Uh, so, yeah, there there's, um, you know, like a, an example. One is showing a queer couple on a couch and uh it says i still love you as much as the first day we quarantined <laughs> these are time limited but but uh you know hopefully we won't need those kind of cards anymore but uh well we're here <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah so and there's been a lot of <laughs> There's been a lot of queer cohabitation that has happened during the <laughs> pandemic. I will tell you what. <laughs> um, I've got a few things happening. Um, I have my first original graphic novel co-created with Sara Alfaji, uh, Squire, which is a YA Middle Eastern fantasy book um, that kind of revolves around the question of when you are in an empire, what happens when you are not the person who is being served? Um, and that is called Squire. It's coming out from HarperCollins in uh, the winter of 2022. Yes. Um, I also um, wrote a Ms. Marvel graphic novel for that's kind of middle grade um, for Scholastic and Marvel. Um, they're going to be announcing the artist of that soon and where you can get it, but that will be coming out by the end of this year. I have a few licensed things that are coming out really soon. I have a story in the Women of Marvel anthology, and I have a story in the upcoming Wonder Woman Black and Gold um, anthology, also from DC Comics. And finally, I am writing also with Sarah Alfaji on art, the free comic book day issue of um, Avatar The Last Airbender from Dark Horse. So nice. you can find that in August. Um, and you can find, listen, I gotta pay rent. <laughs> you can find um, my kind of personal zine projects uh, digitally for free on my website, NadiaShamus.com. Um, but you can also get physical copies if you like through Gumroad. Um, and, uh, I think that's everything I'm doing. Just got to go check out all those things. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, sorry, yeah, that was like amazing. a checklist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, would, uh, anyone like to talk about their process work at all? Do you feel like wrapping it up now? I know you mentioned it a little bit beforehand, Kamiko, but you, uh, it's up to you guys. Sorry, I keep saying guys. I'm trying to use a different word than that, but it's just coming out of my mouth. <laughs> You're good. Um, I mean, we kind of got into, I don't know, Keith, were there other things that you wanted to, uh, to talk about? Well, earlier I was saying about how, you know, like uh, color choices for our comics, like for example, you, you yours, Nadia, was like, um, like kind of like echoing the Palestinian flag with the red, green, white, and black. And like how with us, it's like for, for our book, it's 
like more of like a blue gray like kind of like washed out blue gray white black and white and so I feel like graphic memoirs in some way kind of like work in like kind of like muted you know <laughs> like not as opposed to like brilliant colors or whatever just maybe because it's like I don't know, I was just commenting on, like, the idea of, like, navigating, like, memories, too. Like, you know, like, memories are not mostly technicolor. <laughs> like, how? <laughs> I don't know! Like, you know, kind of, like, the lens of the visual language that we choose, like, limited palettes. And it's also symbolic significance of, like, you know, for, as, for example, for Nadia's um, comic and, as, and like, to that sort of, like, when you met, when you were mentioned when we were making that book, you were mentioning how, you know, none of the experience like actually truly registered until you were like away from it, and you know, and you know, I was just kind of like commenting, just commenting on. That. <laughs> yeah, no, I think there's like a very classic feeling to kind of like uh, the smoky gray black and white memoir comic. So I think that that's like, yeah, you're right. It's very like in line with like kind of the way that we visually seem to like to talk about, you know, to talk about our memories. Um, I mean, even, I mean, uh, the artist Natasha Alterici has a very painterly style, but even kind of in the choices to kind of do these like muted versions of these colors um, is, uh, you know, kind of sort of like everything has sort of like a Vaseline filter on it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I don't know. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think it's it's interesting, especially depending on what kind of thing you're talking about. Like I have on my website for free another one, another short story called Summer in Brooklyn that is like not bright, bright, but it's like I'm trying I'm trying to remember like a really like good summer day when you're a kid and everything seems like yes, you know, so yes. so, the, <laughs> so like the color choice kind of goes with it um you know I I actually had a question for you both um and especially for you Kimiko um I wanted to ask what was it like to I guess talk about your relationship in in the memoir because I imagine that that must have been you know um both my partner and I are chronically ill and when I think about like kind of those little moments I guess I think that they are so like specific and intimate in a way that's I guess hard to explain to someone who hasn't experienced you know helping like a like a loved one through you know surgery and whatnot so I guess I was just like wow like it's it's tough (laughs) that's a really tough thing to tackle how 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 was it (laughs) Um, yeah, uh, in, in moving, certainly when I was originally imagining it, it was not to include, um, anything about my relationship and, and really, I think Keith kind of made me realize that the, uh, how I started was really talking about strangers and, uh, my relationship with strangers. So, you know, people in my cancer support group or doctors or whatever, but, uh, we then moved to, okay, we're actually going to start talking about, you know, my r- romantic relationship, uh, my relationship to my parents and, uh, you know, other family and friends. Um, and so that was really difficult um, and was, particularly when it came to my parents, was happening in live time. So, you yeah. know. Uh, it was interesting. <laughs> we also <laughs> thinking for an artist collaboration because, um, you know, keep, needs to get something down and like oh wait <laughs> you know this is an evolving situation here we got to tweak this wording um <laughs> yeah but uh but I guess in, in terms of my relationship in particular it, it maybe an even added complexity was that this it's my ex um in in the book so I mean in some ways maybe easier in other ways uh harder um so I had kind of drafted it before um and then at an early version i showed it to her oh can you hear me oh i think maybe jordan is yeah i think so yeah is this um on with the show 
to you. Yeah, maybe we'll. I'm sure they'll hear us. I'm sure at some point. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Um, Jordan, can you hear us now? Did that, did that log, for, did that lag for you guys as well? That, that no, no, it's just on your end. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Things look better now. We're um, back in order. Last I heard was um, that it the relationship you're in, it's now your ex, and then you caught off at such a <laughs> inappropriate <laughs> <Yeah>. time. <laughs> um, but yes, basically, I showed it to her at the early stages and said, you know, this is what I'm thinking about. Like, is there anything that you feel uncomfortable with? Um, and that's why I, I kind of had a similar process with all the people that are in the book. Um, and the other thing that I did was everybody, aside from my family, everybody looks different. So I didn't tell Keith what my ex looks like. Um, you know, we gave like racial descriptions and that yeah. kind of stuff. I didn't um, want to know. <laughs> so that you know if there are any likenesses in here of other people of doctors that kind of thing it's just kind of how it ended up happening um so and and then I also you know chose asked folks um you know what names they want used and and that kind of thing um so that provides um you know some kind of privacy for people um and but I mean even it's interesting the question around kind of the intimacy of reading you know it is like I mean I'm I think we need to talk about sex more but it's still something I'm getting used to so you know sharing okay I'm talking about libido I'm talking about sex drive you know is not something that I I uh, necessarily do outside of you know friend circles um so yeah I think um there is some some challenge and there Keith actually did this beautiful page of kind of a breakup scene, a fictionalized um, breakup scene. I'll see if I can, um, if I can find it. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. So it's just kind of working through on my, my own end and then also, um, you know, conversations with, with people and, and what they feel comfortable with. And an added thing to that is that I, since I didn't want it, like, cause to also to, for, for privacy reasons, like, I didn't specifically want to know any faces. Like, like I had to draw Kimiko's parents and like family, but like around their relationship, I'm like, literally, I didn't want to know for like, for, for added, you know, added protection, um, you know, that, you know, this is a person that, you know, like an actual person. So yeah. it's like, it, it helps to better, you know, basically like just involve my subjectivity regarding the matter and like let myself interpret the story in that way so that you know it doesn't get too specific like you know even like having the same hairstyle for me it's like too telling like for me it's like eh, I'm drawing a real person <laughs> like, you know but like if a fictional per if it's a fictional person then it's like <laughs> oh, I don't I you know I don't really mind <laughs> I just I just shared so this is uh Keith's page um of us breaking up and uh so well, there's a black background, um, gray inside the panel, it's a full spread. And I'm looking as my uh, ex is walking away, it's winter time, there's a barren tree in between the two of us. And um, she's got a bag. Um, and uh, the caption at the top middle says, losing her was devastating. Not only the way every breakup is hard, but also because she'd been such an important support and knew more than anyone else about how cancer had affected me emotionally. Um, so kind of ties back to what you're saying, Nadia, about you know when your partner is also kind of the, the carrier of um, much of how you're dealing with a, any chronic illness or, or disability, um, well, the emotional side. And you know that's kind of still the case. She's this one person um, who was, there in that very particular time in my life. And um, there will never, you know, that I, I can share with my, you know, current partner about what that experience was like, but that's always, it's always gonna be a different retelling. Um, so I think, you know, grieving that to a certain extent um, is also important. Stop that now. Well, well, uh, I suppose that will wrap things up. I'll get you all to, um, I guess, give yourselves an outro by 
saying your name once again and plugging your social media accounts if you so choose or your website or what have you and then we'll say goodbye i think we actually got one more question oh so there is one more what are you reading Damn. right now any recommendations oh my nice God. Oh my gosh, I have to tell you. (laughs) (laughs) Pete is ready. I'm currently reading two books. Um, One is a reread. It's How to Do Nothing by Jenny O'Dell. It's about doing nothing. I'm I'm simplifying it, but really it's about how to engage, uh, disengage from social media media in a more meaningful way. And then another book that I'm reading is um, the winner of the Giller Prize, uh, How to Pronounce Knife by Subhan Kam Um, It's so good. <laughs> I'm just saying, these short stories are my jam. So like, anyway. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I just finished reading Butter Honey Pig Bread, um, which is also by Arsenal Pulp and was uh, Canada Reads finalist. Um, it's the first novel I've read in a, a while. Um, I think I've gravitated, I didn't read comics kind of growing up. And then since finding them, it's like all I'm reading. Um, That's what happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so, but I, I picked up this book and, and loved it. Um, queer character. There's a lot about food and sensuality and, and both kind of romantic sensuality, but also just kind of the way Audrey Lord used it in the erotic sense of being, you know, in touch with the world. Um, it's by Francesca Equiasi. Um, and uh, yeah, would highly recommend. Um, I just finished for a graphic novel. I just finished um, The Magic Fish by Trung Lin Nguyen. And it was amazing. Just totally beautiful story about um, a, a comic about um, a young uh, boy who is trying to use fairy tales to kind of connect with his mother um, through, I guess, just um, diaspora feels. Um, And um, the novel that I finished recently that I absolutely loved was a horror novel called The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones, um, who is an indigenous writer. And it's about four um, indigenous men after a hunting incident that comes back to haunt them some years later. I also started recently White is for Witching by Helen uh, Oyami, um, which is kind of about like a generational story about kind of some, a very strange house that has been passed down the family and some which stuff that's happening in the background of that. And also um, like just touched Mexican Gothic by Sylvia Moreno Garcia. I am on a horror kick lately. <laughs> um, and uh, I, do, I don't, I haven't gone far enough to give like a really good t- description of this one, but um, you know, I've heard amazing things. So we'll get back to you all. <laughs> Sweet. Well, I guess the outro in that case. Start with you, Kamiko. What's uh, give you some information about yourself? I guess. <laughs> uh, okay, so Kimiko Toby Matsu, and uh, you can find Keith and I both kind of jointly at Kimiko Does Cancer on Instagram, uh, on t- Kimiko Toby Matsu on Twitter. Uh, we also have a Facebook page um, and a website, Kimiko Does Cancer dot com. Your cards. Yes, I was, I was getting there. I'm, I'm working on the self problem. <laughs> um, and then uh, on uh, Etsy for the cards, um, it's uh, etsy.com slash shop slash Kimiko and Co. And on Instagram at Kimiko and Co. Dot cards. Um, I am Keith Heniza. And you can find me on Makeshift Love. I hear myself in my headphones. <laughs> um, but, oh. Yeah. Um, so like at makeshift love at like Etsy, in Twitter, Instagram, wherever else you might think of finding me, it's makeshift love. But yeah, <laughs> that's me. 
Um, so I'm Nadia Shemes, uh, saying Nadia is fine. You can find, like I said before, a lot of my work, smaller personal work for free on my website, um, N-A-D-I-A-S-H-A-M-M-A-S.com, just one shot. My Instagram is also that, even though I don't really post anything that interesting on there. Um, I'm my Twitter is Nadia underscore Shamas underscore. There is some other Nadia Shamas who is sitting on my handle. I will fight her someday. <laughs> um, <laughs> it wouldn't be terrible if it was empty. Like, no, but like, no, no, I check every so often and it's like a person who hasn't posted since like 2014. And I'm like, please. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Just delete the account. But uh, but also I'm on a Twitter hiatus. So like you know, you'll kind of DM, find me. But, yeah. But, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> um, and and I've got a million things coming out soon. So uh, I hope you all stick around for that. And I think that's it. I don't know. My Wonderful. Just, well memory of a goldfish okay. lately. I just like <laughs> it for you yeah yeah not to mention every year there's another thing to sign up for and another account to latch your name on to so these things are always changing um, <laughs> on the tiktok yeah i mean i i love tiktok i have not been brave enough to post yet i because i'm like not looking forward to some really witty teenager just cutting my head off right. <laughs> comments for me to be like this is my workspace and they'll be like depression much and i'll be like okay <laughs> bye okay millennial <laughs> 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 well thank you all it's been a pleasure it's so nice to see and hear yeah. all of the stories that you had to share um i'm jordan with the kind of comics open library you can find us at our instagram is canada comics ol and our website is canada comics ol.org thanks to all of our writers and drawers and artists i guess the best word to use and we'll see you all in the future Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.